you if you took out any sort of half trillion or trillion dollar chunk of the deficit, that would meaningfully impact some of my macro outlooks, for example. Um, and what what really comes down to is what groups are receiving it and what propensity to spend or what velocity do those have, right? So something mm -hmm. like food stamps or stimulus checks, they're going to circulate a lot quicker because they're going to people that are kind of break even to begin with. And so most of the, most any extra income they get, they're going to spend. Whereas if you're wealthy and you get extra income, uh, you're if anything, you're likely to put it into financial assets. You're more likely to get asset inflation than consumer price inflation. You're not going to like buy more energy or buy more groceries because you have more money. You're going to buy another property. You're going to buy more stocks, for example. So um, those details matter. In the intricate dance between fiscal policy and monetary policy lies a concept known as fiscal dominance, a phenomenon where sovereign deficits and debts wield significant influence over the effectiveness of central bank maneuvers. Lynn Alden, a respected financial analyst and strategist, delves into the depths of fiscal dominance in her insightful analysis. In this video, we'll explore Alden's elucidation of fiscal dominance, its historical context, and its contemporary implications on monetary policy and economic dynamics. At its core, fiscal dominance manifests when expansive fiscal policy, characterized by substantial sovereign deficits and debts, constrains the efficacy or flexibility of central bank actions within monetary policy realms. Alden elucidates this intricate interplay, highlighting how a sizable government deficit can compel central banks to monetize debt issuance, thereby impeding their ability to combat inflation through traditional monetary levers. Drawing parallels to the iconic tenure of Paul Volcker in the 1970s and early 1980s, Alden contrasts the fiscal landscape of that era with the contemporary fiscal milieu. During Volcker's tenure, with federal debt hovering around 30% of GDP, his monetary tightening tactics could effectively curtail inflationary pressures without exacerbating fiscal imbalances. However, the present scenario, characterized by a federal debt-to-GDP ratio surpassing 120%, presents a markedly different challenge for policymakers. Alden dissects the formidable challenges confronting contemporary central bankers like Jerome Powell, particularly in navigating the treacherous waters of fiscal dominance. With fiscal deficits surpassing the combined magnitude of annual bank loans and corporate bond issuances, monetary policy maneuvers yield diminished returns. Powell's task is further complicated by the ballooning interest expenses stemming from the colossal debt burden, which offsets the intended downward pressure on the private sector. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. Let's get right into the latest interview with Lynn Alden. I, I think fiscal dominance is probably the best way to describe it. Um, and so fiscal dominance is when fiscal policy, like sp specifically large sovereign deficits and debts, um, constrains uh, the effectiveness or the options for central bankers for monetary policy. Um, so for a, a common thing, for example, if a government is running a very large deficit and the central bank is basically forced to monetize it because they can't let the sovereign bond market go illiquid or otherwise dysfunctional, then they're basically unable to fight inflation the way that they would prefer to. And so we've, we've seen kind of signs of that. It, like fiscal dominance is not one of those things you're either in or out. There are shades of gray in the middle where you can kind of start getting into it. And, you know, the central bank hasn't lost all of their options, but their their opportunity set, their option set is diminished compared to what it would otherwise be. And so when people think of fighting inflation, they often think of Volcker, right, in the, in the 1970s and early 80s. Um, but people have to keep in mind that the, the federal government back then had only 30 percent debt to GDP. Right. And most of the money creation at that time was, even though deficits were an issue, most of the money creation was not from deficits. It was from bank lending. There was a very high rate of bank lending happening in addition to real constraints on things like oil, for example. So you had a, you had a real world geopolitical issue and then you had rapid bank lending money creation. And so his policy there was raise rates and slow down the rate of bank lending. Uh, and that had the effect of it did increase the fiscal deficit, but not very much because it's only 30% debt to GDP. The interest expense on the deficit was bigger 
but the downward pressure he put on the private sector was larger than that. In addition, it hardened the dollar, and for uh, and this is kind of the, the brutal part of it. It would squeeze out, for example, Latin American countries. They had all this dollar dominated debt. It would put them into a depression. They would consume less oil. They had like a lost decade in oil consumption, and therefore it alleviates the price and the and the supply constraints of th those limiting factors. So th that's basically the strategy that was employed back then, and he had a lot of flexibility because one, the presidents, you know, both Carter and um, um, Reagan were on board with that strategy, and two, he wasn't constrained by the fact that, uh, you know, because public debt was pretty low. The problem is that, and Powell, Powell faces a much harder challenge because. Although at the moment he has less geopolitical issues, right? So oil is still in a pretty comfortable range uh, for the most part. Uh, the challenge he faces is that federal debt is 120% debt to GDP. And so when and, – and more and, – and the fiscal deficit, unlike the Volcker era, the fiscal deficit is larger than the sum of annual new bank loans and annual corporate bond issuance in the country. Uh, and so the majority of money creation, the majority of kind of how money is circulating, the fiscal side is like equal or bigger than the private side. And so when he raises interest rates, it does put downward pressure on the private sector. Uh, so bank loans slow down, corporate bond issuances slow down, um, companies and real estate operators run into some frictions and, you know, it kind of puts that downward pressure. But then it also blows out the fiscal deficit at a four times bigger rate than it would do under Volcker uh, because that entire 120% debt to GDP debt load starts refinancing over time at those higher rates. And so that interest expense blows out by like a trillion dollars if those rates are kept high and for long enough. And that starts offsetting some of the downward force because for you know all that government deficit, including the interest expense, is someone else's income. And they, you know, it, it doesn't have a, as high a velocity to spend it as, say, a stimulus check does. Um, but that spending velocity is not zero. And mm -hmm. so the overall kind of tools become less effective. And I think that we've, we've kind of gone through this phase where in 2022, um, uh, the downward force they were putting was pretty effective. Uh, so it started to squeeze the private sector. We saw most signs of economic deceleration, if not outright recession. So, so purchasing managers indices rolling over, you know, kind of manufacturing activity rolling over, uh, GDP growth rolling over, um, you know, two two negative quarters in a row, even of, mm -hmm. of real GDP growth. All these kind of things were rolling over. But what we started to see by around either late 2022 or early 2023, depending on what metric you're looking at, we started to see that the interest expense was growing to such an extent and actually starting to stimulate certain things. And so some of those things started bottoming, even though the monetary side was still tight because the tight monetary policy was contributing to even looser fiscal policy. And so the deficit started to blow out, um, various economic indicators started to bottom. Uh, and then when they damaged the banking system, uh, instead of uh, just kind of following through with it, you know, if, if they wanted to fight inflation, they could have said, well, look, I mean, if banks blow up, and if uninsured depositors lose money, well, then that destroys some of the money supply, right? They could have done that, but that would have been that would have contributed to instability. It would have been unpopular, and so instead they blinked and they provided liquidity and and solvency to the banking system. So they kind of prevented some of the harsher debt downside to the private sector. Alden elucidates the evolving economic dynamics shaped by the interplay of fiscal dominance and monetary policy initially effective in curbing economic expansion and reigning in inflationary pressures, tightening monetary policies gradually lost traction as fiscal deficits swelled, leading to a divergence in economic sector performance. Sectors sensitive to interest rates, such as commercial real estate, bore the brunt of tightening monetary conditions, while fiscal beneficiaries thrived amidst loose fiscal policies. Delving deeper into sectoral disparities, Alden underscores the widening chasm between industries sensitive to interest rates and those buoyed by fiscal injections. Notably, sectors catering to affluent demographics, buoyed by higher asset returns and discretionary spending, contrast starkly with interest rate sensitive sectors grappling with debt burdens and vacancy woes. Mm -hmm. While still blowing out the fiscal uh, side. And so, ever, especially ever since that kind of early 2023 period, We've been in this period where um, the, the fiscal deficits are a, a leading force in the economy, not, not the only force, but a leading force. 
monetary policy is kind of at a back seat and you have a wider than normal gap between the performance of different sectors because some sectors are more sensitive to interest rates uh commercial real estate being an obvious one because you have both high leverage and short durations and your vacancy problems for example in office so mm -hmm. that's like the that's like the poster child for something that's heavily negatively impacted whereas on the other side of the spectrum uh you know travel numbers for example flight numbers are at record highs and so um there's a number of companies that, you know, that are that are less overall interest rate sensitive and they're more fiscal sensitive. For example, a lot of these deficits are flowing to um, upper middle class people. They're the ones that have the assets. They're the ones getting higher interest rates on their assets and they're able to travel. They're able to go out to restaurants. They're able to do these things. Uh, in some ways, they're catching up on things they couldn't do uh, a few years ago because of the, the lockdowns and everything. And so some of those businesses are actually doing pretty well. So you have this really big gap. Um, between different sectors of the economy because of the wider than normal gap between loose fiscal and tight monetary. If you, if you took out any sort of half trillion or trillion dollar chunk of the deficit, that would meaningfully impact some of my macro outlooks, for example. Um, and what, what really comes down to is what groups are receiving it and what propensity to spend or what velocity do those have, right? So something mm -hmm. like food stamps or stimulus checks, they're going to circulate a lot quicker because they're going to people that are kind of break even to begin with. And so most of the, most any extra income they get, they're going to spend. Whereas if you're wealthy and you get extra income, uh, you're if anything, you're likely to put it into financial assets. You're more likely to get asset inflation than consumer price inflation. You're not going to like buy more energy or buy more groceries because you have more money. You're going to buy another property. You're going to buy more stocks, for example. So um, those details matter. Alden sheds light on the nuanced implications of fiscal allocations, emphasizing the differential impact of various spending channels on economic dynamics. While direct stimulus measures like food stamps and stimulus checks foster rapid circulation, affluence-centric expenditures fuel asset inflation rather than consumer price inflation, exacerbating existing socioeconomic divides. The demographic landscape assumes paramount significance in Alden's analysis particularly the influence of aging populations on consumption patterns and fiscal dynamics. Contrary to conventional wisdom associating aging demographics with deflationary pressures, Alden contends that affluent older cohorts, buoyed by income streams from social programs and asset returns, sustain robust consumption patterns, contributing to inflationary pressures. The, the ongoing large expenditures in Social Security, for example, they're a big factor. Um, because now that that now that's operating at a loss. There were decades where they were taking in more money than they were expending, but now that they've hit this kind of demographics cliff, um, where this kind of you know the, the baby boomers have entered the bulk of their retirement years, uh, yeah. kind of at scale, and so that's actually another really big factor because that's that those are inflation adjusting liabilities, um, and so you know as as that money gets out there uh, and it's more than they're taxing in, um, they're spending. Uh, right. and, and then also, up, but they, they made a big adjustment to that, I think, in did. 2023, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they made a big adjustment. So they spend, they contribute to inflation, inflation goes up, and then they're, and then that adjusts higher. And so when people talk about, for example, demographics being disinflationary, it, in for, for, for many decades, for a long time, generally older age ha was pretty correlated with, with poverty because you'd, you'd lose your active income. And if you were not the type that had a lot of savings, you would run and, you know, you're, you're, you're not starting a family, you're not expanding your house size, so your, your consumption's going down, um, and overall your income's less. Uh, but if, if we're in an environment like we are now, where a lot of the wealth is in the, the, you know, the higher third of the population in terms of age, and then if they have uh, a lot of income from these programs, as well as from their asset savings, their propensity to spend is not really going down a whole lot. They might not be upsizing their house, um, but they are going on vacations. They are eating at restaurants. They are, you know, they're contributing to their kids and grandkids weddings and helping them get a house. And, you know, so that that money is to some extent circulating. And so yeah. I would say that those are, you know, and then, yeah, the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, some of the construction spending that that's contributed to, all, all those pieces together are collectively, I would, I would argue, inflationary and to some extent stimulatory, at least in nominal terms, in different parts of the economy.